to us, um, as he has been doing in the past. Amen? Uh, let's do a quick prayer to kick it off, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll continue with the class. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the power of your word. We ask that you continue to bless, guide, and strengthen us with the power and the wisdom of your word. We pray that you bless all those who are at the reach of our voice. We pray that your word may reveal itself to them, Lord. We pray that you reach even those that may connect later on, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray that you continue to strengthen and guide us, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray that you cast out any oppositions, any doubts, any strongholds that the enemy may place before us, and that you continue, Father, to guide us towards your will as we search the scriptures, the scriptures Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Well, quickly, um, uh, just to do a small recap, Sister Miriam, right, mm -hmm. uh, before we kick it off, uh, the class today, well, we're kind of piggybacking off the, the previous class that we were teaching the, the past two Sundays when we were discussing about the, you know, the speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. and, and the conversation was specifically based, or the class was specifically based upon the question, if a, por if a person has not spoken in tongues, are they saved? And that's, that's basically what we were trying to kind of cover. Yeah. So uh, today we're going to kind of go a little bit different. Uh, we, we, it's, it's, we, you could kind of call it part three, uh, but in reality it's, it's a whole different class. Uh, and it's basically an, a, another question that someone asked me during the week. I received a phone call, or not a phone call, a message, uh, and they had asked me, you know, can anyone speak in tongues? And if so, how? So I'm guessing we've we've kind of anchored ourselves quite a bit on uh, the the biblical aspect of tongues and and what it what it means. Uh, is it important for salvation? I think we covered that pretty pretty good. And if anyone has any if anyone has any questions, you know, like I said, we encourage them to just send us questions. It's important that you continue to search the scriptures so that God can continue to manifest and reveal Himself to you. Uh, you should never reach a point in your life where you feel that that you don't need to study the scriptures anymore. Uh, so, uh, that being said, I want to kind of kick it off real quick um, and um, kind of cover a couple of essential topics that we're going to be discussing. I want to thank those who are connected through Zoom, also those who follow us through Facebook. Uh, we are also live on you on YouTube. So, if you're watching us through whatever platform it may be. Uh, especially Facebook and YouTube, we invite you to subscribe. We invite you to uh, not just subscribe, but also, um, you know, hit the like button, uh, share if possible. This just helps us reach more people. Uh, and the more, I was informed a couple of months ago that the more people hit like, the more uh, these social platforms continue to repeat the video. So. If you're in YouTube, if you're on Facebook, uh, well, we encourage you to like our page, follow, and that's going to be a blessing for your life. Amen? Well, let, let's kick it off with the first slide. Uh, give me one second while I uh, connect it here. And the, the first question, I'm going to ask Sister Mary if she, could, if, she could, if she could go to the first one, if she could read it. That one. Okay, it says, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit... Is the part of New Testament salvation not an optional? It's a post-conversional experience. John three five, Romans eight one to sixteen, Ephesians one thirteen to fourteen, and Titus three five. So so quickly, right? Uh, one of the things we covered, Sister Miriam, last the last two Mondays was. That baptism of the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit, is part of the New Testament salvation. That's kind of just, you know, in relations to the question that we had before, when when it says, you know, uh, it's salvation, is speaking in tongues necessary for salvation? Uh, so one of the things that we covered in the previous classes was that the Apostle Paul, in, in, in the letter to the Corinthians church, he specifies in chapter 14, if I'm not mistaken, and I encourage you, if you haven't seen the those classes that we've taught in the past, uh, they're in the video, they're on YouTube, you could go to Pastor Ruben Andino 
and just look for Speaking in Tongues, Volume 1 or 2. And I think in, 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 in Part 2 was when we covered the biblical aspect of Speaking in Tongues. And we started with the initiation that when Paul writes the letter to the Corinthian church, he specifies that when we speak in tongues, right, uh, it's for the edifying of our spirit. You know, so to, to, to say, or well, the question, do we need to speak in tongues for salvation? Well, if, if the Apostle Paul is emphasizing that speaking in tongues is for the edification of our spirit, I think we would all agree that we need to edify our spirit. Uh, I think right. that, that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. I want to say God bless you to Brother Martinez who just joined us. Uh, I, I, I think we're, we would all be on that page. So uh, that kind of answers the question in itself. And then we went through a, a selective course of scriptures uh, where we, we kind of understand that it's not optional. It's essential. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not a question of, 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 of would you like to speak in tongues or maybe, you know, this is for certain people. No, it's, it's, it's essential. And, and as a matter of fact, I like this phrase. And once again, I also encouraged people last, son, last Monday that uh, one, uh, one of the best resources for this topic is a book written by, by David K. Bernard, and it's called A New Birth. Uh, that, that really goes into depth of what we're speaking uh, also, there's another book out there that I like a lot, which speaks about the gifts of the Spirit. Um, and it's it's called, it's actually called The Gifts of the Spirit by David Bernard. Yeah, yeah. Why these two books are important. The Gifts of the Spirit is, is a more uh, deep, solid material than the new birth. But why is it essential? It's because a lot of times we confuse, and we discussed this last Monday, we confuse the gifts of the Spirit and speak in prophetic tongues with the initial sign of receiving the Holy Ghost, you know, post-conversion, the post-conversion experience when you start to speak in tongues for the edifying of the, of, of, of the Spirit. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, the gifts of the Spirit is important to understand that there's a difference between speaking prophetic tongues and speaking in tongues as an initial sign that you receive the Holy Spirit. So, so quickly... I want to, uh, if you'd allow me, I want to quickly uh, move move along, and I want to go to. So, be before I go forward, uh, give me one second. I forgot to move the that that forward. So, before we go forward, I I put there a couple of scriptures, which is John chapter three verse five, Romans chapter eight one through sixteen, Ephesians chapter one thirteen to fourteen, and Titus three to five. And you can take a note of these scriptures. Um, they're they're kind of important because they emphasize on the fact or the matter that uh, speaking in tongues or the Holy Spirit is not, I repeat, is not optional. You know, it's essential. It's for the edifying of our spirit. You know, the Bible teaches us that salvation is a process, uh, that God starts molding us the minute we, you know, accept him as our Lord and Savior. And he molds us and guides us through the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to anchor myself too much on that because we covered that the last two Mondays, but definitely I would encourage, you know, anybody who's watching this video, if, if you have not seen the, the, you know, Speaking in Tongues chapter uh, part one and part two, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, Pastor Ruben Andino, and it's there. Uh, you'll get more enlightenment of what we're discussing. Today we're kind of going to cover uh, a different conversation, and it's going to be... Uh, is can I speak in tongues and how? You know, can I speak in tongues and how? Obviously, the question is, can I speak in tongues? Is yes. Uh, just to, you know, nip it in the head. Yes, you can speak in tongues. We covered this last Monday. Yeah, the Bible says for this gift for is for flesh. everybody, for all flesh. Uh, so, yes, you can. Now, the question is how? And, and that's what we're going to kind of cover today. And I'm going to ask Sister Miriam if she would be kind enough to... Uh, to, to start off with, with the reading. Amen. It says, To be born of the Spirit is the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the sign of speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues uh, has the initial sign of one receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Should not be confused with the gift of the tongues. He has speaking in an unknown tongue edified himself. So this is basically a recap of what we spoke last Monday. Yeah. 
just just three essential categories that I think are important for us to cover. Uh, number one, uh, when uh, Jesus Christ speaks to Nicodemus in John chapter five, if I'm not mistaken, um, I don't, I think that was chapter three, if I'm not mistaken, the book of John chapter three. When 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 Jesus Christ speaks with Nicodemus, uh, one of the things we covered is that Jesus Christ explains or expresses the plan of salvation and tells him that you must be born of the water and of the spirit. So when the Bible, when you hear the phrase uh, born of the spirit, it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the sign of speaking in tongues. That we covered last Monday, and I encourage you, if you didn't, if you weren't connected with us, go to my YouTube channel and go to Speaking in Tongues Part 2. Also, we covered speaking in tongues is the initial sign of one receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost should not be confused with the gift of tongues. That's another thing that we covered. Um, and like I said, uh, it, you know, we have all this covered in our, in, our, in our previous classes. And then uh, last but not least, we went into, we kind of dissected a little bit the letter that Paul writes to the Corinthian church. And the reason we did that was because a lot of people used it at Scripture, chapter 14, chapter 11, chapter 13, and they try to say that speaking in tongues is only for selective individuals or the for, or for the, 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 the first church, the initial birth of the church. And, and when we kind of dissected that, how important it is, that it says that, you know, that when we speak unknown tongues, we edify ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the, 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 the perspectives that we cover. Today, I want to initiate and I want to invite you to accompany me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 to 15. And I'm going to ask my brother, Carlos Martinez, who's connected with us, if he if he would be kind enough to um, read. To, to read that for us. I'm going to put it in the on the board. Right there it is, brother. So if you're following us from home, we encourage you to go to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 13 to 15. Brother Martinez. Amen, Dominic. In the name of Jesus. For as the body is one, and had many members, and all the members of the one body, being many, are one body. Also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jewish or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. First Corinthians 12, verse 13 to 15. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Martin. So quickly, uh, let, let's kind of dissect this scripture before we move on. L listen to how he expresses himself. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. And one of the things we learned last Monday was that this was a couple of years past the day of Pentecost. So why is that important? Because it kind of shows us a, a small window on how the church operated uh, after the day of Pentecost. Remember that in the day of Pentecost, none of the churches existed yet. It was the birth of Christianity. Now we jump forward a couple of years forward. Remember that in the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Paul wasn't present. So now we have the conversion of the Apostle Paul. We have his ministry after he had planted churches. And now he's, he's not in Corinthians. This is a letter that he writes to them because he hears of their behavior and certain things that he disapproves of. So in well, understanding that, let's dissect that it says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body of that one body, being many, are one body, it says, So also is Christ. So why is that essential? Because if you've been following our classes, you know, one of the topics that we continue to kind of uh, circle back is that he's expressing. That the as the, the physical body is one with many members. I have ten fingers, ten toes. You know, I have I have arms, I have feet, I have legs, I have a head. You know, those are all members of one body. He yeah. says, you know, so is also in Christ. What is he saying? That the body, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are also one. It says, so also is Christ. Then he says. For by one spirit are we all baptized into the body. Why is this essential? Well, let me let me put it this way. 
it's telling us that let's pretend that this individual right here represents us, represents you, represents, you know, the, the human race. And it says that for by one spirit, we are all baptized into the body. So we know that it's speaking of the body of Christ, Sister Miriam, but is expressing to us how do we enter the body of Christ. It's saying we are baptized into the body by one spirit. What spirit is it referring to? It's referring to the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the promise. So why is that essential? Because if you analyze the word baptism, it needs to be submerged, to be to be submerged. Uh, so when it says that you're being baptized into the body by one spirit, it's saying that the spirit is submerging us, you know, into that body. So when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that's essential is that you will be submerged in the presence of God or in the spirit of God. I mean, and and, and that that's spectacular. That That's that's just a wonderful understanding of what is happening when you're filled with the Spirit of God and, you know, post-Christianity. Listen to what it says. It says, rather we be Jews, rather we be Gentiles, rather we be bond or free. It says, and have been all made to drink into the Spirit, you know, for the body is not one member but many. So what it's saying is it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where you come from. It, you know, it, it doesn't matter uh, rather you're free or, or, or you're a slave or you're bound. It, it's letting you know that this promise of the Holy Spirit or, or the promise of being submerged. And, and, uh, we all were baptized. In, with the, we all got baptized with the same spirit. It's only one spirit. One spirit. The Amen. Amen. You know, we were all baptized. And, 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 the Holy and that's essential, Sister Miriam, because it, it brings to the... It brings to the table the initial sign that it's just one God. Mm -hmm. And we've been all baptized through his spirit, through the Holy Ghost. And we're going to kind of cover that, you know, you know, f further on. But I, I like the way the Apostle Paul phrases it when he says, for by one spirit we were baptized. And if you know, you know, if you look up the word baptism, you're going to know quickly that it needs to be submerged. So it says, if we, we could technically read it and say, for by one spirit... We are all submerged into that one body, which is the body of Christ. So it's safe to say or safe to reach the conclusion that you cannot be submerged into the body of Christ except through the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. That's why when you ask the question, you know, can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Uh, do, must I be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues? The answer is 100% yes, you must. Uh, so quickly... I'm going to go to the next the next slide, and it says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, this is Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, He is none of his. Then the phrase describes how the believers is submerged in and filled with God's Spirit. In Acts, the term baptized, filled, received, or felt on, or poured out, or uh, and came on. These, these are the phrases that you see uh, in the book of Acts that uses when somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit. So it, it uses phrases like baptized, being filled, being received, fell upon, uh, poured out, uh, or came on. Um, and they all describe this experience. So, so why is this essential? Because it's important to understand that it's a supernatural experience. Make no mistake that when you are filled or submerged in this whole in the spirit of God, it's a supernatural experience. I think uh, we had Sister Karen last Monday who testified to us when she was in Panama how she felt when she was filled with the Holy Spirit uh, for the first time. And 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 anybody that has gone through that experience, they may use different ways of expressing it, but they're all expressed that it was a supernatural experience. Uh, it's not something that you simply receive only through faith and, and, and that's it. No, it's, it's an experience where, listen how the book of Acts dissects it. Uh, in the book of Acts, you know, you go to chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, chapter 10, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> etc., etc. It expresses it as being poured out, came upon, 
receive, fell upon, being baptized, being filled, being submerged. These are the expressions of what happens to us when the Spirit of God comes upon us. Uh, and then we started off with Romans chapter 8, verse 9, where it says that if someone does not, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, it says he's simply not of him. It doesn't belong to him. And, and, and that's essential to kind of, you know, dissect or answer the question, you know, must we be filled with the Spirit of God? Uh, you know, that's why when we, when we initiated the class, we said it's not optional. It's part of the plan of salvation. It's what incorporates us into the body of Christ. Yeah. And that's something essential that we, sh that we want to, you know, make sure we capitalize on. I'm going to ask Sister Miriam if she could read the next, uh, the next page. Which one is that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It says, um, says on Acts 5.32, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. 11, 15, 17, 19, 2, Galatians 3, 14, and Ephesians 1, 13. Listen to how it says it in chapter 5 of the book of Acts. It says, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. So one of the first things we're going to learn uh, today is in order to receive the Holy Spirit, there needs to be a sense of obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience to the gospel. Obedience to the scripture. Now, you must have an understanding or an explanation of the gospel and of the scriptures in order for you to obey. I think we all agree on that, right? So in Acts chapter 5, one of the things it's pointing out, it's saying, you know, whom God had given to them that obey. And, and that's essential because we're going to cover a couple of scriptures in Acts chapter 11, chapter 19, Galatians 3.14, and Ephesians 1.13, where we're going to notice how important it is that we obey what the Bible tells us is to approach God. You know, many years ago, uh, I was preaching a, a conference. Uh, I was preaching a Holy Ghost rally in, 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 in the border of Venezuela and Colombia. And I think I testified it several times. Yeah, um, and and, I, and I, I remember the sermon that God placed in my heart was, you know, on the Holy Spirit. And I just basically went through the basic scriptures and the Spirit of God, you know, just fell upon the people. And we had, a, you know, that day, you know, over 200 people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, but I remember one individual... Who was who was drunk? Who was uh was was very arrogant? Was very bossy? You know, when while we were praying for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he grabbed me and he said, "Pastor, I don't feel nothing." And I, you know, I, 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 at the moment, at the time, he caught me off guard, and I just quickly, you know, found a way to separate myself. I noticed through the odor that he was, you know, he he was drunk. So the next day, uh, the he showed up for one of the classes during the day and the preacher didn't show up they asked me to fill in so all i basically did was i basically brought a bible study because they caught me by surprise on excuse me on how important it is for us to know how we approach god and i, I went off the scripture of when moses you know starts to approach god the burning bush for the first time and god tells him to stop and tells him to take off the sandals uh, you know, because the place that he walks on is holy ground. Why is this essential? Well, the, the, what, what God was trying to tell Moses is you have to disconnect from all the dirt that you've been dragging throughout the years, right? Uh, because you're entering into an ho a holy dimension. You know, you're, you're entering into a phrase or an atmosphere that, that you're not used to. So when we approach God, you know, and we want to be submerged with the Spirit, the first thing we got to keep in mind is we got to know who we're approaching. And that's basically what I was teaching. You can't just approach God with an arrogant attitude, expecting that He's acting like He owes you something. So that that's essential. And I remember after preaching or teaching that class, the Holy Ghost felt, people were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the individual that the day before, the night before, was claiming that he didn't feel anything, 
was one of the first people that were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, why I'm testifying this? Because how you approach God plays a huge role. And and, 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 and that's essential. I'm going to ask... One of the, the things, Brother Ruben, that, um, uh, you know, when we read the Bible, we see that the prophets, the majority of them, when they would need answer from God or when they would need something from God, they will approach God in um, humillándose, uh, humbling themselves. Humbling yeah. Himself. Um, some of them, they will like fast for mm -hmm. days. That's how they will approach God because they needed like they needed something from God. Or they needed they needed God to speak to them. And some of them, they were like they will go pray for forty days, and that's how we see they approach God because, yeah. like you said. You know, we live in the flesh, and it's, it's hard to approach God in the flesh because, obviously, you know, the Bible says we got to look for Him in the Spirit and truth. But how do you look for God in the Spirit when you are crucifying the, the flesh? Which how, how do you do in that? By sacrificing the flesh. Amen. By fasting, by praying. That's how you, you approach God because, you know, you're doing it that way. You're doing it in the Spirit. Amen. And, 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 and it's true, Sister Miriam, because uh, you'll go into, into the Old Testament and you'll learn that a lot of the prophets and when people approach God, some of them cover themselves in ashes. Yeah, ashes. And it was a form of humbling yourselves. Yeah. You know, we, we, we live in a society where whenever we approach people, you know, we, we, we try to put our best foot forward. Uh, we try to, you know, show that we're tough, that we're strong, that we're independent. Uh, that we know that you know some some of us get embarrassed to even ask for help because you know we don't want to yeah. seem that we need that we need something yeah. and and a lot of times that mentality that lifestyle uh, ha has been incorporated or 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 planted in us and when we approach God we approach God with the same you know attitude with the same you know arrogance uh, not maybe not how would I say maybe not intentionally but but that's what and that creates a, a wall, a blockage. So the first thing we got to do, as Sister Miriam was speaking earlier, is we have to humble ourselves. Yeah. You, you have to find a space where you ask God to just, you know, break any stronghold, any, 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 any arrogance, any, and just humble yourself before. There's a scripture that says that if my people uh, shall, who, who are, yeah, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves mm -hmm. and turn away from their sins. Okay. So points points out two aspects. Number one, if they humble themselves and to turn away, to turn away is basically the definition of repentance. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to be willing to turn away and number two, to humble yourself. Oh, yeah. That You know, that's essential. Yeah. Uh, let, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 5 verse uh, 32. And then I'm going to read a couple of a couple of more scriptures. Give me one second. Let me put it up here. Okay, there, there we go. Uh, so it says, it says, the book of Acts chapter 5, verse 32, it says, And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given unto them that obey. That's what we covered earlier. The importance of obedience. And it says, Peter expressing what happened to in Cornelius' house. You know, we studied last week, uh, chapter 10 of verse uh, of the book of Acts, uh, where, you know, God sends Peter to the house of the Gentiles. And, and, you know, and Cornelius is filled with the Holy Spirit. So now this is Peter kind of, you know, reliving the story and explaining to the rest of the Christian Jews what had happened. And listen to what he says in chapter 11, verse 15 to 17. He says, and as I began to speak, you know, the Holy Ghost fell on them as unto us at the beginning. So listen to the phrase that he uses. Let me, uh, let me share the screen. He says, he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. And he says, as unto us in the beginning. When he says, as unto us in the beginning, he's referring to the day of Pentecost. So he's telling them the same way that I was filled with the Holy Ghost and I spoke in tongues and you did as well. He's saying, so did the Gentiles. Why is this important? 
because the gospel did not change. The gospel that the the 120 received in the upper room, uh, the Jewish community that received in the upper room that day on the day of Pentecost, the, the, the apostle Peter is now testifying and he says, and when I was speaking to them, the Holy Ghost fell upon them as unto us in the beginning. In other words, they spoke the same tongues, that they spoke in tongues as we did. Amen. And listen to what, he, to, to what he continued to say. Now he says further down the line, he says, uh, Then remember I, the words of the Lord, how that he had said, John indeed baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Peter is telling the, the Jewish community that when he saw that the Gentiles were filled with the Holy Spirit as he was in the beginning, he said the, the Bible verse that came to mind was when Jesus was telling John that John baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he says, for as much then as God gave them the light's gift as he did unto us. Once again, he's telling them the same gift that God gave us on the day of Pentecost. He now has given to them. And then he says, who believeth in the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I could withstand God? So he's telling them, what else can I do? I can't get between God and them. I can't get between God and the Gentiles. Why are these scriptures important? Because it kind of, uh, eliminates the argument that people believe that the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is only for a selective chosen group of individuals. You know, the Apostle Peter is telling the the, the Christians, uh, the Jewish Christians, the Jewish community, listen, these people, these Gentiles, received the Holy Ghost just like we did. Mm -hmm. And then he, he goes as far and more and says, hey, listen, who am I to get between them and God? If God is baptizing them with the Holy Spirit. Wh why is this essential? Because nobody, and, and, and I hope if anything I say, this, this stays anchored in your heart. Nobody could impede you from being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a gift. That's a promise. That, that, that's a prophecy that since the Old Testament, God has been anxiously waiting to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And, and, and that's essential for us to, to kind of dissect that in our minds and know that, that yes, God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit with the initial sign of speaking in tongues. And then he says, and when they heard these things, these are now the Jewish community. These are those that were in the day of Pentecost. And it says, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God saying, then have God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So what did they say? When Peter expressed to them, hey, listen, these Gentiles who you thought or we thought, because he falls in that category, weren't allowed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that weren't allowed to receive the promise, that weren't allowed to speak in other tongues. When Peter tells them, hey, listen, they received the Holy Spirit just like us in the beginning. Yeah. And when he tells them this, it says that they held their peace. In other words, they were at peace with what Peter was saying. And then they expressed, wow, uh, so God also has granted the Gentiles repentance unto life. Now, why, why am I anchoring myself in this? Because remember when I said in the book of Acts chapter 532 that it says that God gives the Holy Ghost to them who obey him? Well, one of the initial signs or is, is repentance, you know, and, and you see that the Gentiles identify, I'm sorry, the Jewish community identified that they had been granted repentance because they heard that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, had they not been filled with the Holy Spirit, they never would have said God granted them repentance. And they, they, and they knew it. Uh, that he would, that the Holy Ghost came from God. It was something supernatural that nobody could have given him, but only God. Amen. So if it came from God, that was it. They couldn't question it. They couldn't say, oh, you know, that's not God who's giving it to them. 
because you know they heard them talking in tongues and they knew it came that it came from God. That, that, so they, that, they, there's no doubt there. Yeah, that that, that that's know? that's essential. Brother Nicky says. Uh, Brother Nick Mieles says, you know, God bless everyone. He says, during my studies, I found out that many people uh, believe that speaking in tongues occurs only during the day of Pentecost. This robs us from the supernatural experience, yeah. the gifts from the supernatural experience God is giving us. And then it says killing and then it says kill the flesh. Now, th th that's so true. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and this is something that I pointed out, I think, either last Monday or the Monday before that. Uh, and 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 it's essential. Uh, you know, this is almost diabolical, and I don't want to sound offensive, but if if we fall into that ideology, then we're allowing the enemy to steal from us the essence. Because if he takes away from us being submerged in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, he's literally taking from us the ability of ever having any displays of the gifts of the Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, you can't display the gifts of the Spirit. Now, if you go back to last Monday's class, you'll learn that the initial sign of speaking in tongues is for the edification of our spirit, and that's essential. I need my spirit to be edified. But then speaking in prophetic tongues, I'm going to use this individual, speaking in prophetic tongues uh, is for the edification. It's one of the gifts of the Spirit, and it's for the edification of the church. So what, what Brother Nick is saying is that God, the enemy, excuse me, the adversary robs us of some of the essentials of being Christian. Another thing, Brother Ruben, the Bible said, and you shall receive power. So the Holy Spirit is power that is coming from God to us. Mm -hmm. What is power? Willpower. You know, when you have the Holy Spirit... You've been guided by God. You know, it's, it's like everything changes. The way you think, the way you see things. Yep. It's because you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. With, you know, God has given you the power to see the supernatural, to see the, like, clearly um, how God sees things. And, and if we analyze, Sister Miriam, the objective of the Holy Spirit working in us, He guides us to the truth. Yeah. So if the enemy takes away from us the what's what's supposed to guide us, then we're giving him a huge advantage mm -hmm. because he's the one that's supposed to guide us. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, I, I want to quickly go to two scriptures. Uh, first Galatians chapter three verse fourteen. I'm gonna ask Brother Martinez if he would be kind enough to read it. Uh, is it there? I think it's there now, right? Galatians uh, 3.14. And I invite anyone that's watching us through YouTube, through uh, Facebook, through Zoom, just, just you, you know, you could follow us in your Bible as well. Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. These are scriptures that we should, you know, make a note uh, because they're doctrinal scriptures. Brother Martinez, please. And Jesus is saying, uh, Galatians 3.14, that the blessings of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might be seen the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay. Now I'm going to ask Sister Miriam if she don't mind. She can read uh, Ephesians, which is the next one. Ephesians chapter, uh, one chapter 1, verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trust, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believe. Amen. He was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So let's kind of let's kind of dissect it real quick. Let's start first with Galatians chapter three, verse fourteen. I don't know if Brother Martinez wants to say something. I don't think I have to tell him to interrupt me. He he's he does that naturally. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Galatians, right? Uh, it's talking about a uh, prophecy to uh, Abraham's uh, um, seeds that they will receive the uh, uh, Holy Spirit. Uh, the Spirit of Christ, and it's something that uh, we ought to be uh, noting that uh, from Genesis to Revelations, uh, we have a promise of the Spirit of God to guide us even beyond death. Uh, those people that uh, do not receive the Spirit of God or do not understand what receiving the Spirit of God is are lost in a world of uh, misunderstanding, confusion, 
and mistrust. But when we receive the Spirit of the Holy, the, the Spirit of Christ, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit, or we could understand the truth because the truth is Jesus Christ and it sends us forward to a living a life according to God's will. Uh, I have a personal experience of that. Uh, when I was not a Christian, I read the Bible and I thought it was a mistake of man. I thought it was, and I threw the Bible from one room to the other. I said, how could they write this and say it's of God? Because I was reading it in the flesh. I didn't understand it. It was nonsense to me. But when I received the Spirit of God, He enlightened me to the truth, the understanding of what God's will is, and the obedience of submitting to the Spirit, uh, which is completely different of when I first read the Bible. Now I praise the Lord for that, for the uh, spiritual understanding. And we can only understand the spiritual things through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Listen, listen, listen to how he expresses himself when he says that the blessing of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. There's, there's two, you know, there, there's two, there, there's two components here that I would like to anchor myself. First is understanding that when in the Bible you read the phrase Gentiles, it's referring to us. Yeah. Gentile simply means anyone who's not Jewish, Jewish or who's not Samaritan. Mm -hmm. You could, in biblical theology, categorize every human race or being on the three re religious, you know, aspects. Number one, Jews. Number two, Samaritans. Number three, Gentiles. A Samaritan is a mixture of Gentiles and Jews. And, um, and, and a Gentile is anybody who's not Jewish. So that's definitely us, the Puerto Ricans and the Dominicans, the, the Italians, I know we got an, an Italian here in us. We have a, a Dominican that, that actually asked me a phenomenal question last time. Uh, we're going to get to it later on. So so that's important. Then it says that ye might receive the promise. So the promise that initiated on the day of Pentecost to the sons of Abraham's, you know, to, 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 the, to the descendants of Abraham's, now in the book of Galatians, it's identifying. And remember... As we go further into the New Testament, going back to what Brother Nicky said, uh, as we go further into the New Testament, uh, we're just getting further away from the day of Pentecost. When I say further, I'm referring to several years later. And we still see that the Gentiles are being filled with the Holy Spirit. And listen to what he says. It says that the promise of the Spirit, that we might receive it through faith. This is important. I'll tell you why. Because when you approach the presence of God, you know, the enemy likes to put doubt in our minds and he initiates it, first of all, under the, you know, I, I like the phrase that Brother Martinez says that when we don't have the spirit of God, we're lost in a world of confusion. So when we approach God's presence, we approach him with that magnitude of confusion, of constantly being told in this generation that we're not worthy, that we can't be filled with the Holy Spirit. As Brother Nick said, that this is only for, I think he said, uh, for the for the day of Pentecost. You know, th these are all biblical theologies that we've been hearing for decades. So when we approach God, that's still, the enemy's still singing that song in our minds. And the, the apostle writes to the church of Galatians, he says that when we approach him, we must receive the promise through faith. In other words, you must get close to God believing that God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. That this promise is for you, is for your daughters, is for your sons, is for the Jews. The Jews. It's also for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So it, it's important that if, you know, when we approach God in that manner, that we go there, you know, feeling that you're part of this promise. I don't know if you've ever entered a room. And, and felt left out, or, or if you ever enter a group and they're having a conversation and you feel that you don't fit in, well, the enemy tries to portray that same environment in us as we approach the altar, as we approach God's presence, so that we can feel left out. And there is no need for that. This promise belongs to you. This promise belongs the same way my wife you know, God uses her with the gift of prophecy, and, and he may use me with the gift of discernment of spirit, and he may use the, the next person with the interpretation of tongues. Um, you know, that is for all of us. 
You know, so when we approach it, when it says that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, you must, you know, the word faith means uh, the, la certeza de lo que se espera y la convicción de lo que no se ve. The, the certainty of the unseen. That's what faith means in the book of Hebrews. You know, that you're just certain. You don't see it right now, but you have a conviction. This is for me. And that's how we need to approach God. Uh, now, now, quick. I, I was just saying, Brother Robert, like Abraham, right? The Bible calls Abraham, he's the father of faith. Amen. Because if God told him to go, and he was, the Bible said he was walking by faith, right? So the same faith that Abraham had, God is telling us that we can, um, through Jesus Christ, we get that too. You know, we get the same faith. And by faith, we are filled with the Holy Ghost. Like, we don't see it, but we know that um, if we continue asking God for His Holy Ghost, He's going to give it to us but by re faith. Remember this. The, the apostle teaches us that faith comes through hearing, yeah. and then he says, and hearing the word of God. So what's happening right now? It's not a coincidence. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're watching us live now yeah. or if you're watching this video three months from now, you know, through YouTube, through Facebook, or whatever platform, you know, we may be transmitting through. If you're hearing this, then what God is doing is that God is building up your faith. He's letting you know, hey, listen, this promise is for you. God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And God wants for you to give you with the signs of speaking in tongues. Yep. You know, so let's go to Ephesians. Before I go there, uh, Brother Nick says, it says, the enemy will even attempt to confuse you during your prayers. 100% amen. Yeah. And say, the devil will make you feel doubt. And in every moment, the spirit is about to fall. In any moment that the spirit is about to fall on you. Fight and rebuke in the name of Jesus Christ. That, that is so true. Yeah. I remember once my sister, when I was a teenager, I think I was 12 or 13. Uh, and they were praying for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, my sister came to me when I got home and said, how bad do you really want the Holy Spirit? And I said, well, you know, I'm being sarcastic. She's my sister. And I said, well, obviously I wouldn't be up there if I didn't want it. And she said, well, you spend half the time when you're in the altar and you're doing this. She said. <laughs> that, that, was, that was exactly what, you know, what, 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 what she said. She said, you're, you're up there and you're doing one of these. She said, you know, if, you know, you got to get lost in, in the moment, in the presence, in the, in the worship. You know, you got to go up there just worshiping God like you already have it. Like, you know what? You're just, go, you know, you're you're part of the inheritance, you know. And that is so true because the enemy, you know, we forget. We forget that the enemy follows us to the altar. You know, the enemy will be. It brings uh, thoughts. Yeah, he will be standing next to you and he will be bringing thoughts and he will be. And, and, and I've seen this and I, I thank Brother Nick for bringing that, that comment because. I've prayed for so many people, uh, and uh, I remember that sometimes I feel the impact of God's presence, and 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 just a little shake or or any bump or, or or somebody else screams to the left or the right, and the individual is about to be filled with the presence of God, and they just get they stop, and they're focused on what's happening around me, and that is so true what Brother Nick is saying. So let, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the that Holy Spirit of promise. So let me kind of, I want to put it up on the, on the, on the board as well, because I think this is... Um, I think this is essential, right? Uh, listen to what it says. First, it starts, in whom ye have trusted. I believe trust is built through time. You don't give trust away. Uh, you know, ignorant people just give trust away, and they end up getting scarred, uh, unnecessary. Trust is something you earn through time. And, and I understand that everything I'm saying now, if this is new to you, and if uh, this is something that you've been taught differently, I, I, I totally understand, and I don't expect you to overnight 
to uh, to just simply believe. Uh, and, and God understands that as well. But as you study the scripture, listen to what it says, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. That's why my uh, my, 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 my class in general is taught, uh, the title that God put in my heart is The Truth Shall Set You Free. Uh, and it says, after you heard the word of truth. So the more you study the scriptures and you search the scriptures, that's going to build your faith that this promise of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is for you. That's going to build your trust. And it says, uh, after ye have heard the word of truth, it says, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So two components here. Number one, it's, it's connecting the gospel of your salvation with the being sealed of the Holy Spirit. Just in the scripture alone. Once again, this is the church of the Ephesians. So we've covered the, the book of Acts, which is the birth of the Corinthians, which was written by, by Luke, the Apostle Luke. And then we covered the letter written to the Corinthians church. We covered the letter written to the Galatians church, the church in Galatians. Now we're in the church of Ephesians, and we see that the same gospel is being preached. It's the same gospel. And it says, and secondly, it says, uh, ye were sealed. When you seal something, it means you enclose it. You know, this water, you know, if I don't put a cover over it, if it falls, it's going to spill. Yeah. What protects this water from not coming out when we seal it? When we seal it. Now, it doesn't matter because it's sealed. And what God is trying to tell us through these scriptures is that he wants to seal us. He wants to seal our salvation with the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean? That when you, you accept salvation, you know, you walk to the altar, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and, and now you're trying to live a Christian life. You know what seals that contract? What seals that relationship? The Holy Spirit. That's what seals it inside. That's what seals that pact that you made with God. And and, and that's basically what it's saying here. It's saying, uh, you know, it's saying, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's the word of truth. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit through the promise. So, you know, this is this is essential uh, that we don't forget that, you know, last Monday we covered and the, the, the past two Monday we covered that the Bible records five historic accounts of receiving the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. The Jews, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, uh, the Apostle Paul and the disciples of John in Ephesians. And, and, and we cover those scriptures. So once again, I, I, I encourage you, if you weren't with us, go to the to the previous videos. It's called uh, uh, Speaking in Tongues, chapter uh, part one or part two. And you're going to see that we covered all the biblical principles. But then it says in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, I want to invite you to go there with me. It says, if ye then be an evil, this is the scripture that you brought last, uh, last Monday, I remember. It says, if ye then, this is speaking about us, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. This Sunday. That was this Sunday? Yeah. It says, uh, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? That's Luke chapter 11, verse 13. It says, if you guys, us, that we're evil, know how to give good gifts. Let me put it up here. Know how to give good gifts. Mm -hmm. How much more will the Father give us the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to them that ask? That's why, once again, I encourage you, as, as we read earlier, you know, let your trust in God's Word be built. Let it be built upon the knowledge that, that God wants to fill you with His Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, cast out, like Brother Nick has said, you know, any doubts... Cast out all those those thoughts that the enemy's trying to tell you that it's not for you, that you're not holy. And I'll tell you one thing. Uh, it's true. We don't deserve it. It's true. Uh, we're never going to be ready. So don't think that, that you need to do something physically to, to be able to win salvation or win the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's not what it comes down to. Uh, we're saved by grace. 
by God's mercy, by God's love. And, and, and I'm going to cover that in, 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 in the next few scriptures. Uh, but all we have to do is receive it, accept it by faith. Pass to the altar and just say, thank you, Jesus. And just, you know, get lost in that worship. You know, if, if we go to the next platform, uh, let me put it up here real quick. I was going to ask you about Ruben Dan. Also, a seal is like when you put on a, on a paper, right? Un sello. Yeah. It's a seal. So that's very powerful because a lot of documents, if, if they're not sealed, they're not... Um, they're not valid. They're not valid. That, that's a good... That's a good... So the Bible is telling us that we are sealed with the Holy Ghost. That means once you receive, that, that's it. You are sealed. You are... Um, ¿Cómo se dice? That's Asia. powerful. You know... That's powerful because it, I was reading a document earlier that they sent me from Peru, and it's a, it was a very strong document, uh, and it was it was you know in the document they were expressing strong words, but the first one they sent me the first thing I noticed I said well this is not valid until this it has the seal yeah. of the organization and yeah. then I guess I don't know if somebody told them or what happened then they sent the second one and uh, and they and the second one had the seal, seal on it. Yeah. Uh, and and it's true what you're saying. That's what that that that's what gives it authenticity. Yeah. And and like we said, uh, you know, salvation and the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is that seal. Yeah. You know, the, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's a that's a covenant that you made, and that covenant is sealed, like Sister Miriam was saying, through the infillment of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So quickly. I want to go now to a couple of uh, to, the, to the to the next paragraph, and it says the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the normal, basic New Testament experience with God. It's the new birth of the Spirit. The Spirit is and 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 and, and listen to this. This is how it's described, and and I got the scriptures in the bottom there. Let me put it up better so that we can see it. Give me one second. I'm going to put it up better so we can see it. And it says Isaiah 28 11 to 12. John chapter 16, verse 13, Romans chapter 8, verse 15, and verse 26, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14, and 1 Peter 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Now listen to how it, how it expresses itself. It says, the Spirit is our rest, guide to all truth, adopter, intercessor, sanctifier, sealer, which is what Miriam said, seal, and it says, and the earnings the earnest of our inheritance. So kind of dissect, right, how, how it's expressing it here. It, it, it's like what we were saying earlier. If the Holy Spirit is our guide, then without the Holy Spirit, we have no guide. If the Holy Spirit is our rest, then without the Holy Spirit, we have no rest. If the Holy Spirit is what guides us to the truth, then what's guiding you to the truth if you don't have the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. That's why Brother Martinez, and I fell in love with the phrase that he used earlier. I might end up uh, uh, stealing it from you, brother. Uh, when he said, without the Holy Spirit, we're lost in a world of confusion. Yeah. There's a void in our hearts. Because what's supposed to be guiding us, what's supposed to be sanctifying us, you know, what's supposed to be giving us our inheritance... Oh, is not there. And and, and and the Old Testament and Isaiah calls him, you know, our counselor. You know, that, 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 that's how important that is. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Martinez if he could read uh, Sister Karen is here too. I don't know if she wants to say something. You know, feel free to interrupt. Or we have Amanda uh, who was baptized a few weeks ago and we have Dari as well. So, you know, anybody wants to chip in, you know, don't, don't feel... Uh, Timid. Don't, don't be timid. Don't be shy. Uh, is, is it, let me see what's up there, Brother Martinez. Yeah, that's it. If you don't mind, uh, if you want to read that for me. Amen. Jesus' name. Someone can receive the Spirit by repenting, having faith in God, and asking God for His gifts. We should always suspect speaking in tongues when someone receives the Holy Spirit. Tongues do not save in any sense, but the Spirit baptized... Baptism produces tongues as the initial sign. Once a person receives the Spirit, he has power to overcome sin and live a 
Holy Life, Acts 1, uh, verse 8, and Romans 8, uh, verse uh, 14 and 13. When we speak in tongues, Paul teaches us our spirit is edified. And uh, what, what, what I have to say about this is that we, what we've been saying all along, uh, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we're enlightened into a spiritual world of understanding, of knowledge, of uh, wisdom that comes from God. Outside of the Spirit of God, uh, we are lost, uh, like we're saying, right? in a world of confusion, in a world of hate, in a world of distrust, in a world of emptiness, in a world of in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, the, guided by the uh, enemy of the uh, of the souls, because remember uh, the devil has power over all those that are not in, guided by the spirit, and mm -hmm. that's why we have uh, to uh, acknowledge receiving of the spirit. And we have to call on the Lord to give us of, of His Holy Spirit, and so we could be guided and protected and receive the power to overcome all evilness. We, we are in a world that is contaminated, a world that is going to its destruction. And the only way out is through the Spirit of God, which will guide us even beyond death. Amen. And Brother Amen. Martinez, I want to quickly, right, uh, kind of anchor myself on certain components here that it says, it says, when someone received the Spirit by repenting, having faith in God and asking God for the gift. In other words, repenting and having faith in God and asking God for the gifts. You know, three essential steps to, you know, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but when it says asking God for the gift, it doesn't mean that you pass to the altar and, 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 and all you do is, you know, give me the gift, give me the gift, give me the gift, give me the gift, give me the gift. That's not what it's referring to. Uh, yes, it's good that you should pray and, and ask God, you know, you know, Hey, I, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, give me the gift of tongues. Give me the, you know, I want to know what it feels. That should be in your personal prayers. Mm -hmm. But when you enter into that spiritual atmosphere, you need to walk in there with faith, believing that that is your gift. And get lost in the worship and in the praise. And I'm going to cover that in, a, in, in the next slide, which is my last slide. But this is what it says. We should, ex we should always expect speaking in tongues when someone receives the Holy Spirit. Tongues does not save in any sense, meaning that the tongues is not a seal saying that you're guaranteed a ticket to heaven. Nobody has a guaranteed ticket to heaven this here on earth. None of us. We are in the process of salvation. We are working towards our salvation. But then it say, but the spirit baptism produces tongues as an initial sign. You know, when we gave the scriptures on how every individual in all different categories and aspects of lives were filled with the Holy Spirit, with the sign of speaking in tongues. Once the person received the Spirit, he is has the power to overcome sin and live a holy life. This is what Sister Miriam was speaking about earlier when she said the Holy Spirit, when it comes upon it, it says... And you will receive power. Let's see me. They spoil then when the Spirit of God has been poured upon us. We need that authority, that power, in order to confront sin. Otherwise, like Brother Martinez said earlier, we're lost in a world of confusion. We're constantly struggling and struggling, and we find ourselves, you know, hitting the same wall. It's it's the Holy Ghost that gives us the strength that we need, or, or, or the guidance. Yes, Sister Miriam. In order for us to be able to uh, to overcome those things in our lives that the enemy is trying to uh, to constantly bring us down, break us down. I was preaching a couple of Sundays ago on the strongholds that the enemy puts in our lives, and and, and one of the things that I was preaching about is you know there you know we can break down those strongholds. And listen to what it says: When we speak in tongues, Paul teaches us that we are edifying. You know, we're edifying our spirit. Uh, and, and and I don't know about you, but I constantly need my spirit to be edified. So allow me quickly to go into the last, into the last, uh, into. Brother, I, I want to read, like, uh, the, when you were preaching Sunday, uh, you were saying that a Christian should not be 
in depression. Uh, 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 Christians should not receive uh, those uh, 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 feelings that nowadays we're hearing all over the place where people are falling into depression, into uh, distrust, into uh, they don't know what to do, confusion. Now wait, wait, uh, let me let me let, let me dissect all, that. All these things are attacks of the enemy to uh, overcome uh, the minds and the soul but, of the uh, people that are, are, are in this world. And the only the only way out is receiving, first of all, repenting from sin and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because when we receive the Spirit of God, we are guided outside of this uh, world, which is in uh, distrust, is in uh, uh, every day it has a downfall because it's in darkness. And oh, but, brother Martinez, let me let me uh, let me in, what, uh, let, let me interject right. real quick because we're I'm out of time. Um, and 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 I I, I never said I want to just make a quick correction that a Christian cannot feel the feelings of depression. Yes, a, 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 a Christian, a Holy Ghost filled Christian, can feel. The, the the symptoms of being of, of depression. The enemy will try to bring depression on the life of a Christian. That's 100%. What I don't believe is that a Christian, a Holy Ghost Christian, has no need to be catapulted into depression. You have no you have the key. If you've been baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost, you have the key to overcome depression. So it is not biblical for any Christian to be, it is not God's will for any Christian to be in depression. On the contrary, it's actually, I can biblically prove that it's almost sinful to, for a Holy Ghost real Christian to be in depression. It doesn't mean that if, you know, if, if, if we get hit by a tragedy in life, yeah. that we're not going to be depressed, that we're not going to feel sad. Yeah. But remember, depression is, is it, when you analyze the word depression, and I'm getting off topic, but when you analyze the word depression, it's something that prolongs itself for a long period of time. It's one thing to feel sad, to be brokenhearted. I just lost a loved one. I was just told I had cancer. I was just, you know, whatever negative news you could be confronted with. But when you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, the minute that negative feeling comes upon you, God has given us the key to seek the power that's in us, and His Holy Ghost covers us. And even though he, he gives us hope in the midst of a storm, yeah. my wife sings a psalm that says that you could have peace in the storm. In other words, if you just hang on to what God has given you. you know. So, But anyway, that, that, that's a conversation for another time. Maybe the next topic we'll talk about will be depression. But I want to quickly, you know, kind of uh, go into uh, the last, this is my last page, and I apologize, I took up some, some of your time. When it says three elements to being filled with the Holy Spirit, number one, repent. Uh, number two, having faith, which we covered. And then I want to cover one more element, and it's, you know, that spirit of appreciation. So I'm going to read the, la the last slide, and then I'll come into the picture and, and kind of dissect it a little bit. Uh, this is where it says, the new birth is apparent that the blood of Christ applies throughout the process. The blood of Christ refers to Christ's atoning death that sanctifies God's justice, that, excuse me, that satisfies God's justice and made God's mercy available to us. Let me dissect this real quick, what it, what is, what, what is referring to. We must kind of comprehend this aspect. Number one, that the new birth that we're speaking about, it applies through us you know, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's referring to Christ as the atoning death that satisfies God's justice. What does that mean? That means that we are guilty. We offended God. You know, we strayed away. And then it says, we had a debt to pay. In other words, all of us that are anybody in the in the that that reaches the sound of my voice, the Bible says. For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So we had no access to God's presence. We didn't deserve to be there. We had no business being there. But the Bible says that through the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, it atoned. It atoned 
our sins. In other words, it paid the price that we could gain access. And this is what it says. Without Christ's atonement, we could not seek God, repent effectively, receive remissions of sins at water baptism, or receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, if not for the atonement of Jesus Christ, we had no access to repentance. We had no access to remissions of sins. We had definitely no access to being filled with the Spirit of God. But through his sacrifice, he opened the door for us. There's a scripture that says that when he said, uh, when he turned in the Spirit, it says that the minute he turned in the Spirit, uh, the veil that separated us from the Holy of Holies ripped into giving us, granting us access. Listen to what it says. It says, the substitution, the substitutionary death of Jesus makes repentance, water baptism, and the spirit baptism both available to us. Now, if we go to the book of Isaiah, right? Uh, if we go to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah speaks in, in Isaiah chapter 53. It speaks and it says this. It says, but he was wounded. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 to 8. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Try to understand this. It says, Christ was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chasmet, the chasmet of our peace was upon him. Once again, going back to the, the conversation of depression. Why you, 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 you a Christian has no business being in depression? Because he paid the price for our peace in any storm, in any circumstances. Listen to what it says. It says, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own ways. Listen to what it says. Every single one of us. We have gone astray. In other words, you know, we went upon our own businesses. We backslide. We walked away from God's will. You know, uh, we went, and it says we turned into our own ways. In other words, you know, whatever I wanted to do, that's what I did. Forgetting about God's will. But listen to what it says. And the Lord hath laid on him our iniquities of all of us. In other words, you know, they put upon Christ and his sacrifice all of our iniquities. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep, a sheep before the sheeters is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He says he was not taken from prison. I'm sorry. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare this his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. So Kind of understand what it means to enter the presence of God. If you could understand this scripture that I just read, that your access to God's presence, it's only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When you enter the presence of God, you're going to enter with a spirit of appreciation. Knowing that he paid the price for you, that it should have been you on that cross. But because of you know, the Bible says, you know, that he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. That gave us access. So when I go into the presence of God, I enter his presence knowing that I have no business being here. I'm only here by the grace and mercy of God. What does that does? Well, that automatically incites me with a spirit of appreciation. And that's the key, and this is what I tell people, that's the key for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. When I testify, Sister Miriam or Martinez, how I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I explained that I was always asking for God. I always wanted to be filled with His presence. You know, and every chance I got, I would ask God. But the day that I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I didn't pass to the altar seeking the Spirit. The sermon pricked my heart. You know, the, the preacher... You know, God used him that his words impacted me. Remember the scripture that we read earlier that it says that the word of truth in Galatians, uh, it says the word of truth, it says that ye heard the word of truth, it says gave us the gospel of salvation. Well, that word impacted my life. And what did that word do? Well, it, when it impacted me, I passed to the altar and all I wanted to do was just, just pour out my soul 
in that altar and telling God, you know, I love you. Thank you, Jesus. And you have to open your mouth. And it has to be an audible prayer. The Bible says uh, that, that, that he who confesses him here on earth, he will confess us up there in heaven. That's why we verbally, when we pass to the presence of God, we verbally praise him. We verbally worship him. What We're getting ourselves verbally ready so when the Spirit comes upon us, we're already verbally worshiping God. We're giving the Spirit liberty. When it says give the Spirit liberty, and this is a phrase that we constantly use in our church, when you hear the pastor saying give the Spirit liberty, I'm saying give your spirit liberty to worship God's Spirit. You know, let it go. Let it go. You know, the Spirit inside of you wants to worship God. But sometimes our afflictions, our anxiety, our, our concern about what other people are thinking, the environment around us, we have the appreciation. We've already repented. We've already been baptized. We've already, you know, we're, we're right there, like Brother Nick said earlier. You know, we're, we're, we're borderline ready to fill the Holy Spirit. But we just lack the ability to give the Spirit freedom and just let it go. Let the worships go out. And that's the key to being filled with the Holy Spirit with the initial signs of speaking in other tongues. Brother Nick wrote, uh, oh no, Sister Judy actually wrote, uh, we are locked in, we are locked in with the Holy Spirit as one. Amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 17, she put down. Brother Nick put down, uh, for from Genesis to Revelation, God has never broken a promise. Amen. 100%. See, salvation is a promise and a gift for us. The Holy Spirit will fill you and arm you as we face this world. Get your armor. Amen, amen, amen. I think I stole an extra couple of minutes from amen. you guys. Uh, I'll blame my wife for that and Martinez yeah, right. uh, and, and Sister Karen who spoke so much uh, in, 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 in this <laughs> class. <laughs> I want to just express my appreciation to any one of you guys, all of you that take the time to, to just share with us and, and rejoice with us. Uh, and testify, you know, because we, you know, if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, th th this class is essential because you are a witness to what we're preaching and teaching here. Uh, and your testimony, I thank Sister Karen last Sunday. Uh, she, uh, she, 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 last Monday, I'm sorry, she testified about uh, how she was filled in Panama. And I asked her strategically where it happened because she said in Panama, I received the Holy Spirit in Brooklyn. Uh, my wife, uh, well, she received it in Brooklyn with me. Uh, but uh, uh, there are people that receive it in Venezuela. El Salvador, this is for everyone. It doesn't everyone. matter where you are. God is omnipresent. Mm -hmm. What matters is your perspective and how you approach God. So quickly, I want to express once again my appreciation for all those who connect with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brother Martinez. Thank you, well, uh, uh, Amanda. And, and once again, if, if this is your first time connecting with us, uh, this is just the end of a series uh, which initiated two weeks ago. And the first one was uh, speaking in tongues. That was speaking in tongues part one. Then you got speaking in tongues part two. And then today we started with can I receive the Holy Spirit? Can I speak in tongues? And if so, how? Well, you know, I hope we've been able to answer those questions. If you have uh any further questions or comments, just feel free to send them to us. Also, I want to I want to point out, and I always tell people this. Uh, remember this: don't overwhelm yourself chasing after the gift of speaking in tongues. I always tell people this: give yourself time, but remember the process. Learn how to let the truth, the word of truth, build faith in you. The Bible says that faith comes to the hearing and hearing of the word of God. Give it time to build a faith inside of you. And you're going to see that you're going to slowly learn how to worship God. You're going to slowly learn how to verbally give in to the spirit and just get lost in praise. To some people, I, I know some people that they just, you know, they, they have no, they hold, they hold nothing back. They just dive straight in. And, and, and you see that they quickly get filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak tongues. Other people, I was one of them. Uh, I was the last person in my house to speak tongues. Uh, it was because I was, you know, it took me time to build up the faith and also to verbally just get lost in the worship and the prayer and the, and the, and the praise. Uh, so just give God's word time to, to put you in the, 
in the position where he's going to let it flow. But just remember the process. Repentance, humbleness, humble yourself in his presence and start practicing on worshiping God. Verbally, verbally. That's important. Why? Because if you're just... If you don't learn how to worship God verbally, it's going to be difficult for the Holy Spirit to take control of your tongue if you haven't seen it. Amen? Well, uh, once again, thank you guys. God bless you. Thank you all who connected through us through, uh, through social media, through Zoom, through Facebook, through uh, YouTube. Uh, you know, God bless everyone. And if you have any questions, any comments, thank you, Nick, for your comments. Nick says, thank you, everyone. Great lesson. Yeah. Sister Julie says, great class. God bless you. Uh, and all, all those who are just, just connecting. Well, just watching, it's, a, it's always a blessing for us to be able to share with you guys. And if you just come into this class and you say, man, I wish you were born in, English, in Spanish. Well, on Wednesday, we give it in Spanish. <laughs> God bless everyone. I don't know, como, yo no sé dónde raíz de saber tantas palabras. Como la hermana Alicia. <laughs>